When Ozzy Osbourne was just a young man growing up in the United Kingdom, his dad said to him, I've got a feeling about you, John Osbourne. You're either going to do something very special or end up in prison. It turns out, Ozzy did both. Not only did Ozzy become the most revered heavy metal icon of all time, he also ended up in prison before his 18th birthday. Growing up in a post-World War II era in Aston, Birmingham, Ozzy didn't appear to have many prospects or opportunities as a young rebellious man. One of his first jobs was working in a slaughterhouse. He spent his first four weeks throwing up on a daily basis as he had to cut open the stomachs of dead animals, which he says he eventually got used to during his 18 months of experience in the abattoir. Although Ozzy seemed to be on the right path to holding down a stable job and becoming an average working member of society, he found himself unemployed after beating one of his colleagues several times over the head with a large pole for making fun of him. This was Ozzy's first taste of chaos and he seemed to enjoy it. The same thirst for chaos, however, would land him in prison before he turned 18. So come 1964, Ozzy had found a job that he actually enjoyed, which was working in a slaughterhouse. However, he got fired from that job about 18 months into it for having an altercation with uh, one of his colleagues. He didn't really want to go back to that job or any job, I don't think. And I think this next part of Ozzy's life really determines the path that he was, uh, he was set to go down. He decided to try and be a thief and there was a shop at uh, the back of his, uh, his house that he tried to burgle a few times. On the final attempt, I believe a, a television fell on top of him. So he wasn't a great burglar and he left fingerprints all over the place as well. About a week later, the police turned up and it turned out Ozzy had used a pair of gloves without any thumbs on them. So he just left fingerprints everywhere and he went to prison. Ozzy grew up in a part of Birmingham called Aston, which didn't exactly give him a ton of opportunity. He spent most of his nights either trying to find money to buy a pint down his local boozer, or being thrown through shop windows after getting into fights. According to Ozzy, one fight left him so badly injured that he had a chunk of one of his tattoos ripped out and he spent most of the night in hospital. Luckily, Ozzy learned how to tattoo himself in prison so he could easily ink himself again if he found the urge to do so, which he did often. The first tattoo Ozzy gave himself was a pair of smiley faces on his knees. He said he did this so he could cheer himself up whenever he was on the toilet. With very little job prospects to look forward to, Ozzy had to keep his spirits up somehow. He would soon start to look towards music for that opportunity and hope. After Ozzy was released from prison in 1966, he started to promote himself as an experienced lead singer, despite never being in a band. Even so, he placed an advert in a local music shop. The advert simply read, Ozzy Zig needs gig, experienced frontman, owns own PA system. A few weeks later, a man came knocking on Ozzy's door, replying to the advert. This man would be Geezer Butler, who would later become the bass player for Black Sabbath, although at the time, neither Geezer or Ozzy knew this was going to happen. Even though the Osborne family didn't have a great deal of money, luckily for Ozzy, his father took out a loan to buy him a PA system so people would take Ozzy seriously. Although Ozzy had just met Geezer Butler, his to-be bandmate in Black Sabbath, this wasn't Ozzy's first band. By this point in Ozzy's life, we're talking between, I think, the years of kind of 1966 leading up to about maybe 1968, 69, something like that, around Ozzy being 1920. His first band was called Music Machine. According to Ozzy, they never played a single gig. They generally just kind of hung around the pub, you know, got drunk and, and talked about being big and famous. 
and he was in another band as well with Geezer Butler called Rare Breed. But by the time Ozzy was 20, he actually decided to just quit everything and he, he just gave up. He took his advert down in the music shop so that no one else would come and ask him to join a band and he just didn't think it was really going to go anywhere. He didn't think singing was for him. He didn't think being in a band was for him. Even though he dreamed of, you know, being the fifth Beatle and maybe becoming the next Fleetwood Mac, he, he just gave it all in. Although Ozzy thought he removed the advert from the local music shop and he was never going to sing again, a few months later, two strangers turned up on his doorstep. These two strangers and Ozzy would change music forever. And we were looking for a singer, Bill and myself, the drummer, and we went around the music shop and we saw this ad, Ozzy Zig requires gig. Tony, Iommi and Bill Ward turned up to Ozzy's house and spoke to him about the advert in the music shop. Even though Ozzy thought the advert had been taken down and he was ready to give up on his music career, the three ended up talking about music over a few beers and decided to form a band. Not only was this the last chance Ozzy would probably get at becoming a full-time musician, but the same was also true for Tony Iommi. He was in a band making money called Mythology until some members were busted for drugs, which meant that Tony had to move back to Aston. Being busted for drugs back then was a lot more of a big deal, even if it was just marijuana. The three teamed up with Geezer Butler and Black Sabbath were formed. <laughs> Before the ominous name Black Sabbath entered the scene, the four were initially called the Polka Tulk Blues Band, and they wanted to play deep, heavy South Blues. Even though Ozzy was a huge Beatles fan, and according to Ozzy at the time, they were all blown away by the latest Fleetwood Mac record. I can't help about the shape I'm in I can't sing, I ain't pretty and my legs are thin Not exactly a precursor for the invention of heavy metal music When Black Sabbath released their first single in 1969 the UK charts were heavily dominated with pop and blues music by bands such as The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, Marvin Gaye and even Frank Sinatra who needs me? Although Black Sabbath knew they wanted to write songs about horror and the occult, it's from the netherworld, a vampire, a burdelac. Black Sabbath. As ancient as Their first single was a cover by a band called Crow. Whilst the song had an ominous name, Evil Woman, it was still quite poppy by Black Sabbath standards anyway. I see the look of evil in your eyes. Despite this, their debut self-titled album would mark the dawn of a new musical era, the birth of heavy metal. This debut album by Black Sabbath landed them a number 8 spot on the UK charts in 1970 and it spent 42 weeks in the UK charts altogether. Ozzy Osbourne would spend the next decade fronting the first ever heavy metal band in the history of music, Black Sabbath. Not only would he go on to release some of the most influential albums of all time with Sabbath during their early years, but Ozzy Osbourne was also now firmly set on a path of destruction and chaos with an incredible 40-year solo career as Ozzy Osbourne, the Prince of Darkness. In 1970, Ozzy would be launched into the world of touring and Black Sabbath would spend the next eight years with Ozzy being taken around Europe and North America. During this time, Black Sabbath would be supported by bands such as Van Halen and even Kiss. During the same year, Sabbath would release one of their most influential albums of the decade, Paranoid. Not only this, the very presence of Black Sabbath, 
as well as Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple in the early 70s, opened the doors for bands such as Iron Maiden, Judas Priest and Motorhead, who would all help to spearhead the new wave of British heavy metal movement in the late 70s. This is a true testament to the importance and influence of Ozzy Osbourne and Black Sabbath when it came to the foundations of heavy metal. Despite the almost overnight success of Black Sabbath, Ozzy Osbourne's career was about to take a drastic turn for the worst, when after years of touring and recording with his fellow bandmates, in 1979, Tony Iommi, Bill Ward and Geezer Butler decided it was time for Ozzy to go and he was fired from Black Sabbath. So my separation from Sabbath, I thought it was all over for me. I thought, you know, I was probably end up back in a factory in Birmingham. Just, just that phrase, blizzard of Oz, it means so much that you like, you look at it and you go, oh my God, what's this? Ozzy's back, brilliant. Now we're entering Ozzy Osbourne's solo career, his debut solo record, Blizzard of Oz, and an iconic era for rock music with the discovery of Randy Rhodes. Despite the fact that Ozzy was about to spend the next four decades becoming the biggest metal icon on the planet, his dismissal from Black Sabbath nearly destroyed him. After being fired from the band, Ozzy thought his dream of being a rock star was over and he spent the next few weeks locked in a hotel room in Los Angeles, drinking himself into oblivion. Along with the usual excess Ozzy had become familiar with when it came to substances. Not only was this a defining moment in Ozzy's life, but he was also about to be saved by his future wife, Sharon Osbourne, known at the time by her maiden name, Sharon Arden. Are you crazy? I wouldn't go near him with Dad. I'd end up in my back, just for fun. In a recent behind the scenes video, the actors that played Ozzy and Sharon in the music video for Under the Graveyard gave some insights into Ozzy's struggles at the time. He came to the hotel to die. He didn't have anything else left to live for. It was a very sad period. I remember leaving there. I locked myself in a hotel room for three, three months, just getting smashed out of my brains every day, you know. During Ozzy's near fatal binge during his time in the Los Angeles hotel, Ozzy was introduced to not only his future wife, but to something that he'd never really experienced before, growing up in the cold depths of the industrial city of Birmingham. He was shown pure affection and tenderness. After surviving the 1970s, the 1980s would see Ozzy Osbourne release five solo records, including his debut Blizzard of Oz. However, it would also see him in handcuffs on more than one occasion, his guitarist would be killed in a freak plane accident, and he would be labelled as a madman for biting the head off a live bat on stage. After Sharon had managed to clean Ozzy up and help him secure a record contract, Ozzy started to look for a new band. Ozzy would team up with Bob Daisley, Lee Kerslake and Randy Rhodes, releasing two incredible albums just one year apart. Blizzard of Oz in 1980 and Diary of a Madman in 1981. The 1980s were a great time for Ozzy as he was able to bring his musical ideas to life with Randy Rhodes, something he never had the opportunity to do with Black Sabbath. They simply didn't give him the creative outlet he so desperately desired. Ideas that I've had, which I couldn't musically put across to Black Sabbath because they would not never give me the time of day to try and explain myself. During 1981, Ozzy went out on the Diary of a Madman tour. This is also when he started to hang out with Lemmy Kilmeister of Motorhead. Lemmy was somewhat of a new challenge for Ozzy as Lemmy seemed to be able to drink even more than Ozzy could. Ozzy once said, I've never seen that man fall down drunk, you know. 
even after 20 or 30 pints. I don't know how he does it. Motorhead even toured with Ozzy Osbourne during Ozzy's early solo career, so you can imagine what kind of chaos they must have caused together. Not only would this lead to a lifelong friendship between two of the biggest names in metal, but they would also work together on several songs over the years. Probably the most infamous being Hellraiser, with Motorhead and Ozzy both releasing their own version. Although Ozzy's solo career was making him a superstar, something he dreamed of being his entire life, his relationship with Sharon started to fall apart as they began to argue constantly, largely fueled by Ozzy's substance addictions. Not only this, tragedy would strike the band with the untimely death of Randy Rhodes. According to police, the three were on an early morning joyride after staying up over 24 hours. While some members of the Ozzy Osbourne band slept in their tour bus parked next to the house, the other three buzzed overhead, circling the bus three times. On the fourth time, they didn't make it. Some would say Randy Rhodes was years ahead of his time in terms of his guitar playing. Even Ozzy Osbourne to this day is still incredibly grateful he was given the opportunity to work with Randy in the early 80s. I truly believe if he hadn't got killed when he did, he would be up there with the fucking... Mm. He was fucking phenomenal. Randy Rhodes even co-wrote Crazy Train with Ozzy, one of the most iconic riffs of all time. <laughs> Despite Ozzy losing his friend and guitar player just days before in a tragic plane crash, Ozzy decided to continue the tour, all in the name of rock and roll and in honour of Randy Rhodes. All I can say is, in the last week, guys, the people out there, I've lost two of the greatest people in my life. But it ain't going to stop me because I'm for rock and roll, and rock and roll is for the people, and I love people, and that's what I'm about. I'm going to continue because Randy would have, would have liked me to continue, so would Rachel. Uh -huh. And I'm not going to stop because you can't kill rock and roll. The start of the 1980s was probably one of the most difficult periods in Ozzy's life. The loss of Randy Rhodes was devastating to him, and his relationship with Sharon was chaotic at best. Ozzy hadn't really taken a break from the chaos since his early days of fighting in bars before he even joined Black Sabbath. Not only this, Ozzy was married previously for over 10 years from 1971, a marriage he left to be with Sharon so he really hadn't taken any time for himself to heal or get his thoughts together. There are even reports that Ozzy was committed to a mental institution to be treated for a nervous breakdown sometime during the early 80s, but even this wouldn't stop the Prince of Darkness. <laughs> I just want to go and have some fun, you know. Like on the very first blizzard of Oz tour, after leaving Black Sabbath way back in 1980, we did this very thing when it was great to stay at bed and breakfast, live on the bus, you know, it's, it gets you back down to earth, I love it. The mid-1980s was not only a pivotal point for rock and metal music globally, with the rise of bands such as Motley Crue, Guns N' Roses, Van Halen, Judas Priest, and even Metallica, but it was also a turning point for Ozzy. Ozzy was already riding high on the success of his two first solo records, and the 80s would see him release another three albums with even more success as his LPs started to chart in countries all over the world. Although this was great for his career, the lifestyle of a rock and roll madman saw him lose even more control. In 1984, Ozzy was arrested in Memphis for being so intoxicated he could hardly walk. Luckily, on this occasion, he only spent five hours in jail and was released. In the same decade, Ozzy would be known worldwide for biting the head off of a live bat on stage. Although the bat was real, Ozzy thought it was a toy, which is why he didn't think twice about doing it. Somebody threw a bat on stage, and I thought it was one of these toy bats. So I picked it up, bite the thing's head off, and suddenly everybody's freaking out because it's a real bat. 
Still, in the same decade, he actually did the same thing with a dove during a meeting with some record label executives. This time, he knew it was real. Ozzy enjoyed the chaos. After Ozzy had the infamous encounter with the bat, he had to be rushed to an emergency room and given shots to prevent him from contracting rabies. And I tell you what, guys, it ain't fun when you get them rabies shots. Them shots hurt, man. At the time, a doctor said to Sharon, Yes, Miss Arden, the bat was alive. It was probably stunned from being at a rock concert, but it was definitely alive there's a good chance Mr. Osborne now has rabies. Whilst this kind of behavior would fuel Ozzy Osbourne's infamous image, it would also come to haunt him. During the 80s, his fans would turn up to gigs with dead birds and lizards and start throwing them on stage as he was playing. Ozzy had almost become sort of a cult leader. At one show, a fan even threw a live snake on stage, which terrified most of the stage crew. Although the 80s was arguably Ozzy's most relevant decade in terms of his initial success, as well as securing his place in history as one of the craziest musicians on the planet, the late 80s and early 90s welcomed in a new breed of bands and a shift in popular culture and genre. Whilst many bands and artists from this era slowly faded into the background, Ozzy Osbourne managed to survive because he had something that other bands didn't. He also had the characteristic personality that people remembered, as opposed to just the music. People didn't just love Ozzy's music, they loved Ozzy. The crazy antics of heavy metal were on their way out, making way for grunge, alternative rock, and Britpop, which would dominate most of the decade to come. The 90s would also see a change in Ozzy himself. The once wild man of rock and roll now had three teenage kids to look after with Sharon, Jack Osborne, Kelly Osborne, and the lesser known Amy Osborne, all born in the 80s. Another defining moment of Ozzy's life took place in the 1990s he would finally find himself on the path to sobriety, a path that most likely saved his life. I've been, I've been shamed before, I've been in prison before, I've been all that. The thing comes when you make that decision, you go, I need help, I'm going to get help. Over the next two decades, Ozzy would start to manage his addictions as he focused more on his family life. He would go through several periods of sobriety and relapse, but this time he had more control over his addictions. He began to deeply regret how his behavior in the past had affected his family, his wife Sharon, and his children. He knew he had to start making some changes if he wanted to see his kids graduate college and one day get married. Ozzy's new image and attitude towards life would also be reflected in his music. For Ozzy, the 90s were an opportunity for him to become a real father to his kids, which he saw as the right time to finally admit that he had a serious problem with addiction. He had spent over 20 years being the madman of rock and roll and pushing his body to the limits, and he knew it was time to change. Whilst this new direction in life wouldn't stop Ozzy from touring and releasing records, this new path was a lifeline for Ozzy. It was a second chance for him to finally find some balance and peace within himself. I made many of uh, um, statements about being sober. What I can really say is sobriety sucks. It, it, it wasn't fun anymore, it was just like a drag, you know, and if that gets like, why do I want to do it? But I had to make a few changes in my life. Not only would Ozzy's new family man attitude help him to overcome addictions, but the new millennium would also see the Prince of Darkness and his family launched into an entirely new era of celebrity stardom. On March the 5th, 2002, the first episode of The Osbournes aired on MTV. 
an all-out exclusive look behind the scenes of the private life of Ozzy Osbourne and his family. The show ran for four seasons between 2002 and 2005 and would paint Ozzy in a light like no other. Only his family and close friends had ever seen this side to Ozzy. Although this was a brand new chapter in Ozzy's life, it was also a chapter that would bring with it several long-term health issues. The first of which involved a near fatal quad biking accident, causing a broken collarbone, eight fractured ribs, which were pressing against vital blood vessels and damaged vertebra in his neck. As a result of the accident, Ozzy had several metal rods placed in his back, which have caused no end of pain and discomfort since. More recently, Ozzy was rushed to an intensive care unit after contracting pneumonia and many people feared the worst. Even this, however, would not stop Ozzy Osbourne, the Prince of Darkness. <laughs> 